In this brief video, I'm going to be criticising one of the theories which Adam Curtis, the documentary filmmaker and journalist from the BBC, outlines in his latest popular documentary series called Can't Get You Out of My Head, An Emotional History of the Modern World. The theory I'll be reviewing is contained within episode 6 of this series, titled Are We Pigeon or Are We Dancer? To begin with, some viewers of my YouTube channel will be aware of my appreciation for the work of Adam Curtis. He brilliantly tells stories about the past in an emotional way which captivates viewers, and at the same time, teaches them about the world they live in, about power, and how society has arrived at its current place in time. I encourage everyone to watch his documentary films. In his latest series, Curtis focuses on explaining a number of stories behind how certain figures of the past have utilised power for either collective or individual means, leading to consequences in certain parts of the world today. Curtis focuses on why people today no longer believe in a future as a collective. He believes that through historic circumstances, people today are wrapped up in their own individualism, and politicians act as managers of stability rather than offering new, exciting stories and directions for society as a collective entity. In his latest series, he focuses a lot of attention on China, and where it appears to be heading both politically and culturally. He contrasts modern developments in Chinese society alongside some of the works of B.F. Skinner, the 20th century behavioural scientist who pioneered theories on behaviour modification. I'm going to play a particular segment from episode 6 of this documentary film series and pause to outline my criticisms of the theory Curtis attempts to outline about B.F. Skinner's work. I don't believe Curtis has been misleading about Skinner's work, I think he has misinterpreted what Skinner set out with his theories on human behaviour, and I'll explain this in more detail. The aim was to learn from the data how all the individuals linked together in the society so their behaviour could be predicted, like components in a system. We can trace that every person has a birth but there was a further aim to adjust the behavior of people so they would fit better into the system. It was called algorithmic governance. What China is essentially creating is a surveillance state based upon AI technology. Through tracking the actions and behaviours of people in society, the Chinese government can manage and coerce anyone who exhibits what they deem to be undesirable behaviours. If the data from all the different sources showed a person behaving well, buying the right food for their children, not cheating at computer games, and not jaywalking, then they would be given what were called social credits. This would then give them rewards, from discounts on bills to getting better visibility on dating sites, even avoiding the queue to pay to see a doctor. Fifty years before, an American psychologist called B.F. Skinner had become notorious but he had outlined just such a society. Here, Curtis introduces B.F. Skinner and attempts to map onto the example of social control in China the behavioural science theories that underpin Skinner's work. Skinner had shown how he could easily alter the behaviour of animals, like pigeons, by using a simple system of rewards. He called it operant conditioning. Although Curtis doesn't explain the concept fully, it is worth explaining that operant conditioning is defined as behaviour being strengthened or reinforced through its consequences. Positive reinforcement, which is a term associated with operant conditioning, is any effect in our environments which can strengthen future behaviour. For example, when a reinforcing effect on a person occurs after a given behaviour or action has been expressed by them, that particular response or behaviour will be strengthened and is more likely to occur again in the future under the same environmental circumstances. 
In this experiment, he must peck at the cross 10 times before the food is forthcoming. After four or five sessions, the pigeon learns the routine perfectly and pecks at the cross wherever he sees it without being in the least upset at being made to work for his living. Skinner conducted his studies on pigeons because, physiologically, they're not too dissimilar to humans, and Skinner discovered that human behaviour can also be shaped by environmental reinforcers. Although our brains are a far more complex and intricate organ than the pigeons, humans are, all the time, under the control of their environment, and the reinforcers they encounter in each day of their lives. Think about all the things in your environments which reinforce your behaviours, which are known to repeat into the future. We are all under the control of our environment. The distinction, however, is that China, by implementing a societal control system of their own, are setting up contrived reinforcers on a mass scale for the goal of people behaving in the ways they deem to be useful. With no democratic input on this at all, or agreement from the public on which behaviours should be reinforced in society, Skinner would never advocate for such an unethical use of a behavioural tool, which is neutral, such as operant conditioning. Now that produces in a rat or a pigeon or a monkey or, and in a man, a very high rate of activity. And if you build up, you can get enormous amounts of behavior out of these organisms for very little pay. You don't need to give them very much to induce a lot of that. Now, a world in which a great many productive things occur on this schedule would be a wonderful world. At this point, if anyone watching this video is unfamiliar with Skinner's novel called Walden 2, I urge you to check out my brief three minute video which summarises what the novel is all about. Essentially, the novel depicts a small community in which the environment has been organised by its community members so that value systems such as cooperation, the sharing of resources, and collective action on resolving community problems are emphasised. No one is coerced. People are free to leave the small community. No one is treated unequally through coercive means. Punishment is completely abandoned and replaced with positive reinforcement. These are all aspects of Walden 2 which are not shared with the coercive surveillance states which China would like to build upon. However, Curtis is seen to be associating the two, which is not an accurate representation of the Walden 2 novel. Currently, in most Western societies today, individuals may change their own environment within economical and legal means. There is no collective, experimental action on changing society to improve the behaviours of its people as a collective, and emphasise ethically, socially sustainable behaviours, like cooperative values. Skinner wrote a novel called Walden II that described a future utopia where all human behaviour would be controlled through this kind of operant conditioning. Again, Curtis has misled viewers in what Skinner theorises with his work in operant conditioning and the experimental community of Walden II. It's not arbitrary management of behaviours that occur in Walden II. The environment is what shapes people's behaviours, Everyone is under the control of their environments, whether they like it or not, or whether they know it or not. What's important is whether the environment is shaped and arranged in such a way so that it reinforces socially sustainable behaviours that a collective group of people agree upon democratically. This is what Skinner stood for. Operant conditioning is simply a neutral tool. It was a utopia, he said, because it would free society from all the dangerous and irrational impulses inside individuals' minds. All of that could be sealed off by managing people's behaviour with rewards and treats. What goes on inside people's heads is often reinforced thought processes, reinforced by the environment in which the individual interacts with in every day of their lives. Contrary to what people used to believe many years ago, People do not have a little person inside their head, which is autonomous and immune to environmental changes and effects. Now, China had found a way of creating just such a system of managing people through the mass of data it was gathering. It was being used to create a whole society where what went on inside people's heads was completely irrelevant. Their rational thought and their feelings were all bypassed. It was only their observed behaviour that counted. Operant conditioning deals with observable behaviours as one cannot modify behaviours which are covert. However, Skinner acknowledged private behavioural processes, such as thinking, though thought processes will be reinforced by environmental factors, as no one lives their lives and brains inside a vacuum of zero environmental stimuli. And this allowed those in charge 
to bury and hide the anger and frustration that had been created in a society that was riddled with corruption and growing inequalities. And if people didn't respond to the treats, they could be forcibly reprogrammed. As it is alleged is happening in large re-education facilities in Xinjiang to hundreds of thousands of the Muslim Uyghur population. There were no re-education camps in World in Two. It was a completely voluntary community with no coercion or punishing factors which affect the individual. Here we have an example whereby China is attempting to rule with total control through coercive techniques. This is all I wanted to discuss in regards to Adam Curtis's latest documentary film series. I felt it was important to cover this segment as the work of B.F. Skinner has been countlessly misinterpreted over the years. As much as I think the work of Adam Curtis is essential viewing, where one can learn so much about modern human history in the space of a two or three hour documentary film from him, his downfall at times is taking really complex concepts and theories and simplifying them to a point where sometimes he is not sufficiently communicating the reality or actual intention behind certain theories he outlines. I understand this difficult balance he needs to follow between keeping viewers intellectually stimulated and making sure their attention does not diminish through digesting academic ideas that most people do not encounter in everyday discourse. But when simplifying certain concepts, some important information for viewers is sometimes lost or becomes a misinterpretation about the theory being described. If you enjoyed watching this educational video, please share and subscribe. We would also appreciate any support that can be given towards future video projects by ProSocial Progress through our Patreon account, where you can find the link below. Any support is much appreciated.